In the previous episode, we looked into the birth of Linux, the connection between Multics, IBM, Bell Labs, QWERTY keyboards, and the decision for it to be open source. All of that, combined with computer networking, led to the rise of personal computing around the world. But remember that Linux wasn't necessarily created with the open source philosophy in mind. The GPL license that officially made Linux open source software wasn't implemented until version 0.12. And that single change is when Linux adopted the philosophy of free as in freedom. So how did Linux become what it is known as today? Well, you're about to find out. The history of Linux is actually one long family tree that splinters off into more than 600 different variations. Those variations are called distributions, or distros for short. And so the broad spectrum of Linux is too wide and vast to cover all of these distros. When the software license is free as in freedom, then anyone can contribute. So you have distros like Sabian, which was an Italian Linux distro based around Gen 2, and even smaller ones like Lubuntu, which is a lightweight version version made specifically to be lighter and less resource hungry so that it could be run on older machines. For example, we could create an entire video series on just the Linux distros made for Brazil. But for this series, we'll be concentrating on the American timeline of Linux and look into its philosophy timeline and where that's headed. In America, around the early 1990s, there were three influential and early Linux distros. In May 1992, there was SLS, which stood for Soft Landing Linux System, and it was the first comprehensive Linux distro with the Linux kernel and new license. In December 1992, you had Yggdrasil, or just LGX, which was the first plug and play Linux distribution, which automatically configured itself for the hardware that you installed it on. And in August 1993, there was Debian, which believed that Linux should be auto-updated and maintained from a single package manager. This package manager is called dpackage. And these early distros were designed with specific users and hardware in mind. And since Linux is open source, then developers were always tweaking their systems to fit their needs. For example, one student at Moorhead State University realized that he was taking the same amount of time to make changes on his SLS distro after installing it as it took just to install it in the first place. So he incorporated those changes to be applied during the installation. He called this new distro Slackware, and it's currently the oldest distro that is still maintained. In following this philosophy of adopting and changing distros, from Slackware came SUSE, which was Slackware with German translations. So this movement posed the question, who controls Linux? Well, let's go back to 1998, when ICANN was created. ICANN stands for the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, and it's an American nonprofit organization for namespace databases around the internet. So when you buy a domain name URL, that's ICANN. Well, when you reach another person on the internet, then you have to type an address into your computer, usually through the web browser. And the address, which can be a name or a number, has to be unique so that computers know where to specifically find each other. ICANN coordinates these unique identifiers across the world. And without the coordination, we wouldn't have one global internet. Well, the USA was a sole arbiter for international disputes from ICANN. And this created a lot of problems because it changes the law of licensing between all these things. For example, Japanese software licenses are not the same as American licenses, and so this changed the philosophy rates because of the different countries and different cultures. When Europe and Japan and Brazil started creating their own Linux distros in which they could control and develop, then they created a dizzying array of sister projects that are essentially language adapted distros and tools that are relevant to their country of origin. And to get an idea for how massive Linux is, remember, each distro can be splintered off into other distros. Notice how this came from this, from this, from this, and then from this. So there's all this sharing, exploring, forking, and more going on for a decade since Linux's initial release. Now, let's fast forward to September 2000. You had Nopix, which was based on Debian and designed to be run directly from a CD, DVD, or a USB drive. Nopix was one of the first of its kind for any operating system. It was to run over the network without the need for any installation. So Linux had the option to be portable or overseen by a corporation or as an independent build your own system from scratch. But by 2004, we had RHEL, CentOS, 
at Fedora. The philosophy of Linux was maturing to now run Linux on the server side. And while great for software developers and sysadmins, these distros were difficult to work with for average users. So at this point, we've moved so far into these complicated build your own systems that things go a full 180 degree turn to create a user-friendly version of Linux. And remember, there were over 600 distros. You can see here that as the years went on, some rose to popularity for a short while and others remained a top contender for decades. And after all of this, it led to another question. If Linux needs to be ready for the desktop, then it needs to be ready for both older and newer computers too. And we'll continue that in the next episode. So make sure that you're subscribed here to the Linode YouTube channel so you don't miss it.